Welcome to our Carnegie Council Book Talk. Thanks for joining us. Our guest today is Rosa Brooks. Rosa is the author of the new book, Tangled Up in Blue, Policing the American City. Rosa's life and work are very much in alignment with the mission of the Carnegie Council. Her themes are power and justice, law and the use of force, and ethics as a set of principles derived from lived experience, not divorced from the reality of everyday life. Rosa is best known for her work on national security, foreign policy, and international relations. In this book, she extends her analysis to domestic policy, focusing on public security at home. In this case, we're talking about policing the streets of Washington, DC. This book tells the story of Rosa's enlistment as a sworn armed reserve police officer in the Metropolitan Police Department in Washington, DC. The story takes us through training on patrol and into the lives of the people of the district who interact with police daily and nightly. In doing so, it prompts Rosa and us to rethink the role of policing in society. Now, this book is a truly amazing personal journey, complete with blood, sweat, and tears. And crucially, there's a lot of life-affirming humor in the book, which I really appreciated. Now, if I had one wish, it would be that all of those with the authority of badges and guns uh, have Rosa's big heart, common sense, and can-do spirit. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to turn over to Rosa to tell us just a little bit about the book itself and how she came to write it. Uh, and then we're going to have some Q&A uh, in conversation. Uh, we wanted to make the conversation as inclusive as, as possible. So those of you who are viewing, please use the chat function to submit your questions. And we're going to take those up towards the back end of this hour. So Rosa, thanks for joining us. Uh, and maybe I could turn it over to you for a little bit of an intro to the book. Sure, thank you so much, Joel. Um, I really appreciate uh, your hosting me. This is, this is always a terrific group um, and there are always such smart questions and comments from this group. So really glad to be here. Um, you know, I could lie to you and tell you that the reason I became a reserve police officer in DC was because I, wanted to sort of infiltrate the police department so I could write a book about it, revealing all the bad things about policing and, and so forth. Um, that actually, <laughs> that makes sort of a, a, a nice tidy story to say that's why I did this so I could write a book, but I, it's not quite the way it happened. I, I launched this crazy project, Becoming a Reserve Police Officer, before I had thought about writing a book. Um, and I was, I was at the end of my time working at the Pentagon where I worked for a couple of years during the beginning of the Obama administration. And I, I found out totally coincidentally about this program, the DC Metropolitan Police Reserve Corps. And for whatever reason, and I talk a little bit in the book about what those reasons might be, I'm still struggling to make sense of them myself. I was just fascinated by it. And partly it was just the, the sheer weirdness of this program, you know, that I've heard of cities that have auxiliary, auxiliary police or, you know, who, who help with traffic control at special events and things like that. But DC has this program where anyone, you have to be a citizen, you have to be over 21, that's, that's about it. You have to not be a felon. Um, can apply to be a reserve police officer. And, and if you're accepted, uh, you go through the same police academy training as career officers, lasts about six months, is pretty intensive. Um, and you come out on the other end, as, as you said, as a sworn armed police officer with full police powers. You can arrest people. Uh, you have a gun that is given to you by the city of Washington, DC. And when I heard about this, I just thought, really, that's crazy. You know, that's so strange that, you know, City of DC is going to give a gun and a badge to a law professor and a journalist. That's a really bad idea, right? Uh, um, you know, it just seems so fascinatingly weird to me. I thought you'd let me be a cop that I, I was seized by this sort of instant desire to just see what it was like. I was just, it was just so fascinatingly weird. And I, I you know, I quote in, in the book itself, like, 
quote, uh, George Mallory asked why he wanted to climb Mount Everest and he supposedly said, you know, because it's there. And, and that's sort of the truth of it that I wanted to do this because it was there and it just seems so strange. And, and as you noted, I, I have throughout my career, I've worked, I've worked as a, a human rights advocate, I've worked as a journalist, I've, I've worked for the State Department and the Defense Department. And as an academic, I've always been fascinated by the, the relationship between law and violence and the ways in which we construct narratives to make sense of that relationship and to define certain kinds of violence as good violence, acceptable violence, uh, violence for a good cause, uh, and other kinds of violence as, as unacceptable. And so I, I was curious to understand how police officers who, who work within a, a system that is pretty breathtakingly violent in a global sense, at least, right? About a thousand people a year are killed by American police. I was fascinated with sort of how do cops make sense of that? How do they see their roles? How do they explain this to themselves? Um, and so, and probably I read too many de detective novels too. Um, so I, I did this and I uh, stepped down in November after about four and a half years as a DC police reserve officer. Um, and, and about a year into the experience, I started thinking I, I, should, I should write about this. This is really fascinating and I should write about it. And that's what the book is about. The book Tangled Up in Blue is, is a mix of just stories from that experience um, with some of my thoughts on policy issues when I started thinking I'd write something, I, I think I envisioned myself writing a much more academic book, you know, and the, the, the definitive work on what's wrong with policing in America and what should we do about it with thoughts on the blurry relationship between policing and war making and various other things. And, and as I got further and I kept sort of starting chapters and hating them and tearing them up uh, or deleting them rather, you just you don't tear things up anymore. I, I, I sort of gradually realized that um, Lots of people have written books about policing and what's wrong with it and the criminal justice system and what's wrong with it. And, and I ended up feeling like, um, I don't know that I have something so unique to say about that, that it's worth a whole book, but what I maybe can do that, that is relatively unique is talk about the, the kind of experience, the dual vision that goes with being someone who had one foot or actually probably more like eight toes firmly planted in, in the world of, you know, the policy world, the academic world, the advocacy world, and another couple of toes in the policing world and, and could, could share that double vision and share some of the, the stories of what I saw uh, while I was doing this. So that's what the book is and um, happy to talk about it. That is, that is a that's a great intro. Thank you, Rosa. Let me just pick up. Um, first of all, thank you for your service, for, for doing what you did. Um, Not so, entirely convinced that it always <laughs> made the community better, but that's another story. Well, you certainly tried hard, and that comes that comes through uh, in the book, and the book is is a service as well. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the that relationship between law and violence that you that you mentioned, and. Um, among the distinct characteristics you have is, you know, you've done work in national security and now in sort of domestic and public security as well. And mm -hmm. it's being about that narrative of law and violence, you know, several years ago uh, when he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, we had General Martin Dempsey at the Carnegie Council. And he used a phrase uh, that stuck with me. And he said, my, my job is to manage violence mm -hmm. on behalf of the state. Right. And um, that was, you know, that's his narrative as he thinks about the use of uh, military force. And I'm just curious, you know, how that maps onto your experience, the way, you know, police think about law and violence as they work to provide public security. No, I, th I think obviously there, there are a lot of interesting similarities as well as some disjunctures between the military, how we conceive of the military, how the military conceives of itself and how uh, police conceive of themselves and we conceive of police. I mean, obviously in both cases, um, you know, th th this is sort of the prevailing myth of law, right? Is that it, it's supposed to reduce violence. The rule of law reduces violence, but obviously on some level it does no such thing. What law does is it structures and manages violence by saying, okay, here are the people who get to use violence, here, here are the kinds of violence that we're going to define as a social good 
violence in order to enforce the law, violence in order to uh, create a particular kind of culture that we think is a better culture. You know, the law, the law always, uh, you know, has has violence behind it, right? That somewhere behind the dictates of the law, uh, the command of the sovereign, there are people with weapons and handcuffs to to say, not kidding, even if you don't feel like abiding by it, you have to. Um, and, and, you know, police very much play that role in our society. What's, what's been sort of fascinating in the last, in the last uh, decade in particular, and really the last five, six years, has been the sort of growing, growing chorus of voices saying, is the violence of policing the violence that is, is a social good? You know, is the violence of policing creating, maintaining the kind of social order that we want to have, or is it maintaining and sustaining a social order that, that we really should reject? Is it even the violence that the state is mandating or, or is some of the violence of policing uh, done by bad apples, done by you know, a rotten barrel within the broader system to pick your metaphor? Um, but, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's what cops do. They, 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 they enforce the law as the other term for police officer law enforcement, um, which we use much more often than the alternative term, which is probably we should use peace officer. So that that's that's great. So, but so you write in the book, you say, um, you know, one of the challenges you've seen is, you know, from a military point of view, the military tends to see everything as war, right? And from a police kind of approach, police tend to see everything as, you know, crime, right? Yeah. And so, one of the things I took away was that, you know, maybe we need to sort of rethink that in a way, as you're just yeah. suggesting with the peace officer idea that, you know, can we have, can we sort of change those cultures or should we, should we try to change those cultures in some way? Yeah. And I, I see yeah. in, in the chat, there's a comment from Will Kerr, the deputy chief of police Scotland, commenting that the enabling statute in Scotland sets out the mission of police as safety and well-being and how the police in Scotland have tried to sort of shift to a a paradigm that's more of a public health approach to violence than an enforcement approach, um, and I and I certainly think that the the framing language we use does matter, does shape the the, the story. You know, as part of the stories we tell, it's part of the narrative we create. Um, and when our narrative about what cops do is framed in terms of law enforcement, as opposed to being framed in terms of public safety officers or or or, or peace officers. Um, it, it does affect how, how officers make sense of their own role. And I guess the only thing I would say there is it's not so much an issue of police view everything as crime. I, I do think that, that in a lot of the way we talk about policing in this, in this country makes it seem as though police are these sort of independent actors who, who Police, you know, police departments make their own independent decisions, and they, they sort of operate in a vacuum. And we should, you know, we should get we should abolish police, or we should fix policing, or transform policing. And the problem is that the police need to be transformed. But if police are in seeing everything as crime, it's because we collectively, you know, we the citizens of Washington D.C we, the citizens of, of Virginia or Maryland or wherever, uh, or we, the citizens of the United States, we have elected people who have criminalized an astonishing array of, of behavior, uh, much of it exceptionally trivial forms of uh, misbehavior, very, very trivial offenses. Um, and it is, it is undoubtedly true that the criminalization, and, and I, you know, which has accelerated rapidly in the last in the last 15 or 20 years just the, the there had been an explosion in the number of things defined in the United States as crimes as opposed to civil infractions or they're just not on the books at all but the more you define as criminal behavior if you then say to the police your job is to enforce the criminal law um, and in fact we we also ask police to enforce a lot of uh, civil civil regulations in this country too um, well, you're gonna you're gonna end up arresting people and ultimately imprisoning a lot of people, but the police didn't write those laws, right? Um, that's 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 on us. That's on us as voters. It's on our elected officials, you know. So so I think it's 
there's a we 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 simultaneously need to keep police and police leaders and police departments on the hook for change because there is quite a lot that can be changed by police departments on their own but we also by just saying oh the problem is the police that really lets the rest of us off the hook uh, for the fact that you know we created a system in which police work police enforce laws that they didn't create in a social context that they can't do much to change and that's on us so that raises the inevitable question of uh, the conversation that we're having now is defund the police. So how does that how does that sound to you, and how do you respond to that conversation? <laughs> you know, so so as a as a former reserve police officer, I, I absolutely understand why cops often don't like that phrase because. You know, I was assigned to Washington DC's 7th district and uh, the 7th district police station. Some, you know, any of you who are in the area, go by sometime, take a look. It's a shambles, it's a disaster. You know, the paint is peeling, things are falling apart. Uh, the toilets don't work, the bathroom doors don't latch. The uh, computer, when I, when I first got there, the computers in the report writing room, the keyboards all had the letters worn off them by so many, so many hands typing on them that you, you know, if you couldn't touch type, and I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that one of the great gaps in my education, I never learned to touch type. Um, so I'd be kind of staring at the keyboard going, oh, where, where's the M? You know, I can't find it because, and, and you look around and you say, defund, what are you talking about? You know, we, we can barely afford the kind of minimal uh, equipment to do this job. And there's so many things that you need. Th that said, um, I think when you change the conversation, um, you know, instead of saying, let's defund the police, if, in, if instead you say to cops, what are the thing, it's not so much the question of like, do you have the resources you need to do what you're doing? But if instead you say to them, what are the things that you're doing that you don't actually want to be doing, that you don't actually think you should be doing, that you don't think you're best equipped to be doing? What are the kinds of social services that you wish existed so that you had better solutions if you encounter someone who is mentally ill or you encounter someone who is homeless uh, or you encounter a, a family that is unable to figure out how to resolve conflicts? What are the resources that you wish were there? Um, and do you think that we currently fund them enough? Then I think you, you get a really different conversation and you start seeing a tremendous amount of common ground between police and critics of policing. And, 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 and you know, the question is just how you shift that conversation from enough to do what you do to, well, what, do you, what, should, what should you be doing? And obviously that shouldn't just be up to the police, right? That's up to all of us. You know, what do we want police to do? What role do we want them to play? But, but I think when you actually start asking cops that same question, they actually end up coming out in places very, very similar to even some pretty radical critics of policing. So to use, going back to this will be the last time I'll use a military analogy, but um, I can't resist. So, you know, in the military, they talk about kinetic solutions and non-kinetic solutions and moving, you know, away from use of force to sort of other ways of thinking about providing security yeah. Um, I mean, is there an analogy here or am I overplaying that a little bit? No, to think about? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, and, so, right. you know, um, counterinsurgency doctrine is, is uh, fallen out of favor um, right. in recent years. And it is absolutely fair to say that, that whatever we thought it was, the U.S. never proved to be good at it. Um, but, you know, I think the, when you, when you see the, so what lies underneath counterinsurgency theory is, is the idea that ultimately security is not just a function of enough people with guns using, using sheer coercion to prevent people from doing what we don't want them to do, that in fact it has to do with persuasion, it has to do with establishing a sense of the legitimacy of, of government actors and how do you do that? Well, you can't establish legitimacy if your government is, is predatory. You have to have a government that in fact is providing services that in fact is protecting populations and so on. And that's, a, a, I think, a, a framework, um, whatever terminology you want to use that, that 
again, I think I think most most police officers actually would tend to agree with, but that is not the direction the training pushes them in, and is not the direction that our current budgetary decisions push in to sort of say, hey, if we want to think about security in a, in a broader sense, um, you know, or to use another another term uh, from the international domain, sort of human security, uh, uh, in a holistic way, yes armed people who can use coercive force have some role in that, but, but much more broadly, we need to be looking at uh, what are the problems here? How do you address those problems? How do you meet people's needs? And that's part of establishing a, a willingness on the part of ordinary people to, to go along with the law, the rules, whatever we, whatever we decide they should be. There's a, there's a great scene in the book, uh, which helps to provide, I think, empathy for what it's like to be a uniformed armed police officer, where you describe in great detail, I think it's the 30 pounds of equipment <laughs> that you have to wear your duty belt and all of that. As I was reading that, it made me think of, um, you may have read at some point, uh, Tim O'Brien's book, The Things They Carried, mm -hmm. where at the beginning of that, that short story, he, he um, enumerates in great detail all of the things that, that are in his knapsack and on his back and so on as he mm -hmm. patrols in Vietnam. I, it was sort of an interesting yeah. analogy, but it, but it did make me think of um, the sort of militarized, you know, what, what, you know, what, what we're asking um, officers on patrol to do. And maybe you could just tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about, <laughs> about that scene in the book and, <laughs> and why you wrote it and, and what, what you did carry. Uh, and, and, and how that reflects on what you were asked to do as an officer on patrol. Yeah, you know, I partly wrote about that just because I realized that before I embarked on this sort of bizarre extracurricular activity, I had <laughs> never really thought one way or the other about what police officers carry or, or what they wear. I remember I went on a, a ride along um, with uh, some officers uh, as I was going through the application process and I noticed for the first time that they were wearing um, uh, ballistic vests under their shirts. You know, I sort of saw the outline of the of the vest. And I was like, "Oh, no kidding! They're wearing ballistic like they that's what they do." And and yeah, that is you know, it is a standard part of the the uniform. It's mandatory uh, for police officers in D.C. Um, except if you're you know working inside headquarters or something you know if you're out there you're you're wearing a ballistic vest and, and the vest is now external rather than internal although a compromise between militarization and non-militarization is that DC police uniforms now have a, a vest which has a kind of fake buttons and a fake pockets so it sort of kind of looks like a regular shirt except it's not it's clearly a, a ballistic vest um, and I, I sort of realized I had never, given a millisecond's thought. I knew police officers had guns and I knew that they had these big belts with stuff on them, but I had never really thought about what that stuff is. So I thought, well, if this was kind of fascinating to me to discover firsthand what that stuff is, it might be of interest to, to others. And so, yeah, you've got a lot of stuff. You've got, you've got your, your firearm and in a holster, you've got, uh, you have a flashlight, a big heavy flashlight, you have your handcuffs and typically you have at least two pairs of handcuffs because you put them on a prisoner, the prisoner's taken off, you don't have handcuffs anymore. You may or may not find your handcuffs again, so everybody carries ex extras. Um, you have uh, rubber gloves because you're always touching icky stuff. Um, you know, people vomited on themselves and there's urine all over them or whatever. Um, you, you, have, uh, you have your expandable baton. Um, that in theory you could whack people with. Um, it's actually quite rare, I'm happy to say, in ordinary policing. You have you have OC spray, which is basically a police version of pepper spray. Um, you have a tourniquet that you carry. You have an entire uh, tactical emergency casualty care kit that, that people usually wear on a, a leg, you know, sort of a leg holster. Um, you have you know snacks, you have your cell phone. For a long time, you had to carry both a personal cell phone and the department issued cell phone because the department was too cheap to get phone service on their cell phones. They only had data. So you could use them. And in fact, you were required to use them for crime scene photography and to tag and upload your body worn camera videos, but you couldn't make a call with them. So if you wanted to be able to make a call, you had to have a second cell phone, your own cell phone. You have your radio, you have your body worn camera, 
there's more. You had to have the specified number of pens uh, with a specified color of ink in the specified position in your in your pockets. Uh, so there's a lot more. Um, but but you know, I one time I just weighed myself before I put it all on and afterwards, and I realized that it you know 30 pounds or so of equipment. That's a lot less, obviously, than soldiers carry. Um, uh, but it's it's a lot. I also realized what I had always thought of as cop swagger. You know, the way cops kind of walk like. You know, I always thought that was sort of, oh, because it's they're arrogant or they're expressing dominance. I realized that, no, it's just that you've got so much stuff on your on your vest and on your uh, belt uh, and sometimes on your legs. You cannot have a normal stance anymore. You, you have this sort of wide stance because there's just so much stuff. You can't just have your arms, arms down by your side. You have to walk kind of like a bow legged cowboy just to accommodate all of that equipment. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So I'm curious of how you think about um, this sort of direction that you're suggesting of, you know, demilitarizing the police in some way, which would go along with, uh, you know, de-escalation, you know, decriminalizing and so on. Um, there are 400 million guns in the United States. Mm -hmm. And we know that, you know, militias are, you know, active. Um, yeah not only across the United States, but they've, they've come recently to Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you, how do you start yeah. to pro process these sort of social yeah. forces that are coming together? You've got this very strong, you know, point of view that, that I was, I was getting from your book about, you know, the need to rethink um, in the direction of demilitarization while we've got such a militarized society. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I don't think it's it's a simple question. I don't think I know the answer. Um, yeah. No question about it. We live in a gun saturated society. Um, and the rationale for American police being armed is that uh, lots of ordinary people are armed too, which means that if you encounter someone uh, on while you're patrolling, the odds that they are armed are actually a lot higher than in many other societies. And um, so I, I don't necessarily take the position that we should have unarmed cops. Um, I, I would argue that many of the tasks we currently assign to armed police officers are not ones that do require armed police, right? And, and let me give an, an example. Um, we have decided as a society that we want to have armed, uniformed police officers enforce uh, civil traffic regulations. So you turn right on red where there's a sign that says no right on red. We have decided that we think it's a good idea to have a uniformed armed officer stop your car and give you a ticket. Um, we're so used to that. We never question. We're like, well, of course, yeah, that's what the police do. They stop your car if, you know, if your brake lights out or, you know, whatever. Um, but think about how you would react, how any of us would react if you missed an IRS filing deadline and the cops came to your door uh, with their weapons and demanded that you step outside and let them search you and so on because they wanted to let you know that you had missed the deadline for filing your estimated taxes, you know, or if the city thought that your fence was too tall or your tree was hanging over your neighbor's yard too much and the city residential zoning department sent armed police to, you know, order you to step outside while they told you you had to do, you know, it's crazy. We would be like, that's nuts. What an over, what, that's overkill. You know, maybe we need armed people, but it's the same with traffic violations, right? You could make the argument that if obviously if someone is a fleeing felon or is firing out their window or is driving drunk that you need armed officers, but on the other hand, um, it's not particularly obvious that you couldn't either have, you know, unarmed traffic monitors or simply more speed cameras, although that raises its own issues, um, you know, and just give people tickets. The likelihood, you, there, there's, a, there's a real question about how much sort of violence creates violence, you know, and how much, yes, we've got lots of armed people in our society, and traffic stops for police are one of the most dangerous things. Traffic stops, domestic violence calls are, you know, that you, you, you're, you're most at risk. The driver is most at risk and the police officers are most at risk, which sort of raises this question, why, are we, why do we have police stopping so many people? Because the very presence of an armed officer stopping your car increases the likelihood of violence. Whereas if you had you know, you were flagged down by the unarmed traffic cops who just gave you a ticket. 
maybe the armed driver would be a lot less likely to react with fear and anger, um, you know, or simply you get a ticket in the mail from the speed camera, which DC does do quite a lot of. And I'm, I, my car, my car is a felon. My car is constantly getting, uh, getting in trouble. Um, it's the car, not you, right? It's totally the car. The pictures <laughs> of the car. I'm like, oh, car, how could you, um, you know, speeding through the 395 tunnel and so forth. Um, but you, 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 you get the idea. I mean, I, I, these are choices. These are choices that we as a society have made. And I don't know that it's so much an issue of the militarization of police, but rather an issue of what we as a society think requires the presence of armed uniformed people to, to enforce as opposed to, hey, we can handle that in some other way. Or maybe we don't really care. Maybe we think most people will abide by the no right on red and the few who don't is not a big deal. Off they go, it's annoying. Yeah. It, um, that's great. I have some more questions. I just wanted to encourage those who are watching. Um, if you have questions or wanna make a comment, you can use the chat function and we'll be getting to those in the second half of the hour here. Um, Rosa, our friends in Scotland have um, given us a couple of, of comments and it just prompts a question from me. Um, have you given thought to, you know, other other societies, uh, other ways of policing? And have you looked into that at all? And just not curious as much, your thoughts not about as, much as I as I wish I had, actually. I mean, I, right. I know a little bit, um, but I, I and that would be a, a, you know, as I said, I sort of ultimately made a decision in this book to stick mostly to, hey, this is what I saw. Um, right. um, but but I think that is a, you know, I think the U.S., does have a great deal that we could learn from the experiments that other societies have made to see if they can change the nature of policing. Um, and I, I, I think that, you know, I think the militarization issue, I, I actually, just going back to that for a sec, um, I actually think that people get way too fixated on the wrong thing when we talk about police militarization in this country, and this is related to, to uh, one of the comments in the chat, um, we get really fixated on the optics. Uh, you know, cops in some small town driving around in Humvees and um, tanks and stuff like that. And that's, that's nuts, it's unnecessary. Uh, we could have a whole conversation about the you know, provision of surplus military uh, goods to police departments and why most of the time I mean, it's one thing if it's a filing cabinet, it's another thing if it's a tank. Um, most of the time that's kind of nuts. Um, but I think that that is the most superficial aspect of militarization and the, the deeper aspect is cultural. Um, and one of the ways that you see it that I think is most, most toxic is in police training, uh, police academies in much of the country um, there are exceptions. There are there are some really innovative exceptions, but by and large, they're still kind of modeled on the sort of 1980s parody version of a military boot camp, with lots of "Yes, sir," you know, and "Get down and give me 20 kind of stuff going on. And I worry. I mean, that's a form of militarization as well. Mm -hmm. um, that's less visible than cops driving around in Humvee, but. I think more harmful in many ways because here's what happens if you go through your police training being told to speak only when spoken to being shouted at or physically punished through through exercise you know do, doing push-ups and so on if you do the wrong thing well a lot of recruits are going to come out of that thinking um it's okay to yell at people who have less power and it's okay to inflict pain on people who disobey you and that is the very opposite of the kind of lesson that, that we should be trying to give to future police officers. Great. Rosa, I wanna ask you um, for another personal reflection, if you don't mind, um, because you write so well about your experience um, on duty uh, in 2017 at the inauguration of President Trump. Uh, and I really enjoyed you know, that, that, that sort of chapter, but what I was thinking, you know, um, since you wrote that, um, you know, we had the events of January 6th, the insurrection at the Capitol. Um, and I know you were not um, on duty and on patrol on that day, but I, don't, I just can't resist just sort of asking you your, your thoughts and your reflections um, on January 6th, um, having been uh, a uniformed 
police officer, you know, at the inauguration in 2017, it probably was not hard for you to imagine uh, what it was like for those on duty uh, this earlier this year. Yeah, no, and I, I know a lot of officers who were on duty and who were at the Capitol on the 6th and, and have had a, some really uh, powerful um, conversations with them. Um, um, you know, and it was, it was really kind of, so, so one thing I should, I should back up and I should say that one of the things that came out of this experience for me was that together with some colleagues at Georgetown Law where I teach and, and some colleagues within the DC Police Department, we created a program called the Police for Tomorrow Fellowship Program. It's kind of a corny name, um, where we we we're now in our third cohort of fellows. The program lasts a little over a year. Young officers, and they they we select them. They have to apply, and they come to Georgetown Law for pretty intensive workshops on what we think of as sort of all the hardest issues about policing. You know, policing and race. Uh, you know, the role of poverty, what is the role of police in a diverse and democratic society. And um, these are young officers who, they, you know, it's self-selected group, they, they, they have to apply, they're people who really want to be talking about those issues and who really see themselves as potentially change agents from within policing. And, and we had a session for our fellows just to kind of informal debrief after January 6th. And, and it was really uh, pretty emotional just watching them try to process this. And I, you know, one, one young officer said, who's a former Marine, he said, I saw people in that crowd wearing Marine Corps shirts. And I thought I might have been fighting alongside you five years ago, and now you want to kill me you know, and the sense of betrayal, you know, I saw people with these thin blue line flags and, and they were trying to kill me. Um, and, and also, you know, spe you know, for many of the officers, especially the, the African-American officers saying, I, I can't understand, I can't, how do I live with the fact that in the summer when, when heavily black crowds of peaceful racial justice protesters showed up, uh, not my, my department, much less than the Secret Service Police and the Park Police, but to some extent, the sort of feeling of like we treated them like, like they were dangerous and scary. And now look, these, this mob of white nationalists just waltz in and, and, and we treated them like they weren't going to be a threat. I, I, how, do I, how do I make sense of that? How do I have, and, and even just these much more granular kinds of dilemmas, like we had police officers here in DC who, who took a knee to show solidarity with racial justice protesters in the summer. And some of them were disciplined for doing that by the department, we sort of said, you're, you know, you're, how is this different from fist bumping a member of the Proud Boys? Um, you know, you're a cop, you don't get to show your personal beliefs um, on the job, you have, you have a job to do. And this is not, you know, in your personal life, do you wanna say Black Lives Matter, go for it, but this is not something you can do on duty. Um, and we, you know, we had really passionate debates about that. You know, are these the same thing, the fist bump to the Proud Boys and taking a knee? Are these different? How do you articulate the differences? But I, but I think that, you know, January 6th is, it's so interesting because I think it really displayed for Americans, for all of us, policing at its best and its worst in the very same day, in the very same incident. You know, we saw tremendous courage and self-sacrifice um, on the part of police officers literally defending democracy. We also saw uh, what looked like indifference or, or agreement with an angry anti-democratic mob. And, and, and I, I think it's, I hope it will open up a really, some more space for a more nuanced conversation about cops. I mean, and this goes back to your question about guns, you know, and, and well, and, and, and the blurring between war fighting and policing, we may want policing to be much less violent most of the time, but we also want police officers who can fend off that angry mob, um, an angry mob of armed violent people. And, and how do you square those things? I think, I think it sort of sets up that conversation in a really, in a really interesting way. Great, we have some excellent questions uh, from our audience. So I'm gonna turn to Alex Woodson, who's just gonna gather them together and offer them to you, Rose. Great. Alex Shaw? Yeah. Uh, sure, so we'll, I'll, I'll just ask two questions. 
and then we can take it from there. So this is, this is from Jonathan Gage. Do you see value in more slash better nationwide standards and rules and accountability in response to current concerns over, for example, excessive use of force against people of color, use of chokeholds generally, et cetera? And this is from Reed Bonadonna, a uh, former Carnegie Council fellow. Uh, would a separate officer corps, like in the military, have benefits in the area of leadership and accountability? Oh yeah, those are really good questions. So, um, so as you probably know, on the accountability issue, as, as you probably know, um, one of the enormous difficulties is that the US does not have a national police force. Um, and this is unlike many other countries where, where policing is, is a matter for the, the national government. Um, here it is primarily local, uh, it is state and local. We have roughly 18,000 different law enforcement agencies in the United States. Um, the majority of those are municipal police departments, um, you know, town police, local county sheriffs, city police. Um, the rest of them are, uh, you know, campus police or various sort of special special duty police, uh, like like the U.S. Park Police or the Secret Service Armed Police. We even have a, uh, you know, every every federal agency has its own police, um, and those 18,000 ish law enforcement organizations. Um, they don't report to one another and they don't necessarily talk to one another. And that is something that's very different from the military. We have one military, we have one commander in chief, uh, we have one secretary of defense, which in turn means that the, you know, it's still hard in the military, but there the mechanisms for sort of doing lessons learned exercises or saying, okay, we're now changing the policy um, are relatively straightforward. You know, the military decides it's gonna end, don't ask, don't tell. Um, you know, the Secretary of Defense says we're ending, don't ask, don't tell, and everybody says essentially, yes, sir, and there may be a little bit of foot dragging, but we have a hierarchical entity um, and, you know, everybody ends up getting changed and the policy changes. And you can't do that in policing um, because it is so decentralized and the only kind of common floor, uh, and it's a really low floor, is the Supreme Court's jurisprudence on the Fourth Amendment in, in particular. Um, but the Supreme Court's jurisprudence is extraordinarily permissive to police officers, makes it very, very difficult to hold police accountable because essentially the standard boils down to, you know, if you use lethal force, could a reasonable officer without second guessing them, could a reasonable officer have believed in the moment that they faced a lethal threat? And it's, it's extraordinarily difficult to come up with constitutional violations because all an officer has to do is say, well, I, I may have been wrong, but, but for an officer, it wasn't totally unreasonable for me to have thought that I faced a lethal threat and had to use force. Obviously states are free to raise those standards uh, and change those standards. Cities through just internal department regulations are free to alter that floor and raise it. And, and many cities, including DC have replaced this very permissive framework for the use of force with one that emphasizes the sanctity of human life uh, and rather than just whenever you feel threatened you can use lethal force and that emphasizes force as an absolute last resort et cetera et cetera um, but but no we have tremendous accountability gaps uh, the Supreme Court's doctrine of qualified immunity is also an enormous part of the problem with Congress under the control of both houses of the Democrats for the time being, Congress can't obviously mandate rules for state and local police, but they can create incentives to change those accountability structures, and they they absolutely should because right now it's a it's pretty much a disaster. Um, oh, and the other question about an officer corps, yeah, that's a really interesting question. I, I have kind of mixed feelings about it. You know, I, I on the one hand, I think that. Um, it's kind of weird when you think about it that the only way to become uh, a senior officer in American policing is to start as a, you know, the lowest level of patrol officer and kind of work your way up. That doesn't necessarily make sense and it probably keeps out of policing many people who would be terrific at other levels of the organization and also women and so on <laughs> because they don't want to kind of slog through rising up through the ranks and being a patrol officer, it makes it almost impossible for people to move laterally into policing from other professions. Um, conceivably, some kind of officer corps could change those, those dynamics. 
On the other hand, I, I do think there is something to be said for saying, uh, you know, we don't want to have a kind of artificial hierarchy as we have in the military between, you know, commissioned officers on the one hand and enlisted troops on the other with NCOs kind of in between. Um, so I don't know, it's a, it's a great question. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I have an informed opinion on it, but it's a really interesting issue. Okay, uh, another question here. Uh, this is from Alice Timken. Say for example, I was chosen to join a city council citizen panel on policing in a small town. What advice do you have for someone in a position like this at the local level who hopes to reduce violence, refine the, bu refine the budget and find productive solves to typical police community problems? Gosh, I'm gonna kind of duck that question um, because I, I actually think that I would wanna know a whole lot more about what the issues are in that community before, before making generalizations about what you should do. Um, I'm assuming that this, I'm assuming that this is not a purely hypothetical uh, citizen panel. Um, uh, I'll just give a little bit more context. I'm sorry I didn't yeah. read this. Uh, uh, specifically, is East San Francisco Bay Area and your uh, yeah, open. yeah. Even so, I I I don't know how to answer that question in the abstract um, because what the priorities would be would would very much depend on the uh, what what the department is like, what the issues are in that community, you know, what existing rules, laws, structures there are. Um, so maybe we could talk about it uh, in another setting with more granularity. Sure, so this is another question from Jonathan Gage. How do you view the role and influence of US police unions on efforts in the wake of George Floyd to moderate some police, be moderate some police behavior and increase accountability? Um, I think that Police unions have, in many parts of the country, been a force for, not a force for good. Um, uh, and I say that as someone who believes very strongly in unions and their importance, but I think that uh, Police unions have, you know, and there are exceptions, um, and there are some efforts to create kind of alternative police organizations. They, they have been a regressive force that has focused much more on protecting job security and protecting the status quo than on being part of um, being part of meaningful change and being part of that conversation. Um, I think the Fraternal Order of Police, uh, you know, which endorsed Donald Trump for president, is played a particularly pernicious role in in recent years and and um, has been part of the kind of radicalization and growth of extremism in American policing, which is a whole other topic. Um, I think I mean it's interesting. This is something that we were talking about with with the officers in our fellowship program about. Well, the good thing about a union is that the union is made up of its members, and if you don't like it maybe it's time for a new generation of, of police officers to be demanding unions that are, are more change oriented. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, it, I don't think police unions have by and large played a positive role. Rose, I'm gonna jump back in here. So this is a good transition into, I wanted to use these last few minutes to talk about Policing for Tomorrow program mm -hmm. and maybe some of the ideas that have um, come out from that. Um, and so my first thoughts are things around perhaps recruitment. I mean, who becomes a police officer? Um, where's that going? Um, training, as you've said a little bit about, maybe you could say more. And then also just rethinking the function of policing as well. And then accountability. I mean, th these are things as a layperson from the outside would seem kind of, you know, first order questions if we're sort of rethinking policing generally. So it goes from recruitment to training to the function itself to then accountability. But again, I'm from the outside. I'm just curious how it looks from where, from where you sit. Yeah. yeah. Um, so police departments nationwide have struggled to recruit enough officers. And I put that in, in air quotes because obviously whether you have enough officers um, is very much a function of what quantities of officers you think are needed to do the things that you happen to think police ought to do. 
Um, and I, I, I do think that whenever there is uh, an increase in crime, there, there is a public call and a, you know, city councils and state legislature, oh, we need more police. Uh, and then, you know, you have to try to recruit enough people, but we don't often, you know, it, it's, it's easy to fall back on, well, we just need more cops. Um, but there are, sometimes you do need more cops, but there are also plenty of reasons to sort of say, well, maybe we don't need more cops. Maybe we need fewer, but different cops doing fewer, different, better things. Um, but, but that said, I, I, no question about it. Um, departments have struggled to meet their recruiting targets in part because uh, public perceptions of policing have been very negative. Um, and, and a lot of people feel like, oh, I don't want to be a cop. Everybody's just going to hate me. Um, I do think, and, and what that has meant for many departments is they're screening out the psychopaths. They're not picking and choosing the best people. Um, I do think there was an abortive effort in the in the 1960s to create a kind of a national uh, police corps, like a sort of Teach for America, but government sponsored with with um, you know college tuition assistance and so on. I do think that we should be thinking about things like that. You know that whether it's part of a broader national service scheme or whether it's a standalone scheme. You know, and one of the things we're hoping to do in in the D.C. area is use the Police for Tomorrow program and related programs as a recruiting tool. Um, because, you know, part of the way you change policing is you change who becomes police officers and you bring in people with different sets of assumptions and attitudes who are critical of policing. Um, <clears throat> policing also in this country is overwhelmingly male nationwide, about uh, only about 12% of law enforcement officers are female. Uh, there are all kinds of evidence to suggest that greater gender diversity would make a very substantial difference in the day-to-day -day experience of policing um, and, you know, recruiting more women would, this, this actually links up to training, right? If you have a very militaristic training system with a heavy emphasis on physical strength and fitness and toughness, you know, and doing more push-ups and surviving being yelled at and shooting a gun well, you're probably going to push away some groups of people more than others. Uh, and in particular, that's going to be alienating to a lot of women. Um, which goes to why we need to really rethink police training. Um, you know, if, if, it's, if it's seen as this, you know, hazing ritual involving push-ups and getting yelled at, it's going to be very hard to recruit women in particular, but also other groups. If police training is seen as emphasizing not just physical fitness, which is important, but also de-escalation skills and, and sound tactics and working within the community, working collaboratively with social services departments, working collaboratively with community groups. You have the ability both to recruit, I think, a, a wider range of people. And frankly, I think you're doing much more to prepare officers to not just enforce laws, but to be people who are actively working with community members to think about, you know, what does make this community safer and more prosperous? How should we be prioritizing uh, and so on? And, and one of the, I will give a, a tremendous amount of credit to the Metropolitan Police Department here in DC for really beginning to overhaul the police academy curriculum with a view to encouraging critical thinking, encouraging recruits to ask questions rather than discouraging them, encouraging a kind of granular knowledge of communities and, and how do you talk to people? You know, how do you talk to people? How do you, how do you talk to people in a way that is respectful and empathetic? And that's the kind of thing, obviously, that we, we need to do much more. And for anybody who's interested in a great example of a really successful program to do that, uh, I draw their attention to the work of uh, Sue Rar, who's the former sheriff of King County, Washington. And she now runs the Washington State Law Enforcement Training Academy and has pioneered an approach um, uh, that really emphasizes verbal skills, de-escalation skills, uh, critical thinking and problem solving. And they don't do less training in physical tactics. They do more because her argument is that a lot of the time when cops end up using excessive force or pulling their gun out, it's because they're scared. They don't think they can handle things without pulling their gun out. Whereas if you give them the physical confidence, the confidence think, oh, I can handle this, they're a lot less likely to pull their gun out. So these things aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. You can have police who are prepared to face physical threats 
but where the emphasis is much, much more heavily on the skills that you need to defuse situations instead of escalating them. That's great, Rosa. So just as a very last question, um, can you leave us with some sense of optimism that um, you know, in the wake of the protests of 2020 and where we are now that this, there's sort of a, been an awakening or a conversation that is actually constructive? Um, I, I left the book feeling that way, but just wanted to give you the last word on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm an optimist, I'm, um, um, and I love working with these young officers. Um, they're pretty amazing, and and we also sometimes through the same program we bring uh, guest speakers to the police academy to talk to all of the recruits, and and we've had we've trained some of our law students at Georgetown to be discussion group facilitators. Um, and you know, as a as a teacher, among other things, it's it's pretty cool um, the kinds of conversations that happen. There, and I think there is a real hunger on the part of young officers and recruits to be talking about these hard issues and to be talking about how to transform policing from within. You know, and and it's really kind of amazing the conversations that start taking place between people who start out thinking we don't have any common ground and end up each saying, I never thought of it that way. I, you know, this makes me think of some things I can do differently within my community, within my, within my agency. So, you know, I, I, I do think both in terms of the national conversation about policing, a little more space to have that in a nuanced way has opened up um, in recent weeks and months. Uh, but I also think in terms of you know, who goes into policing. I, I, it is my hope very much that we are going to see a rising generation of police leaders who think about policing in a very different way than, than people 30, 40 years older than they are did. Well, thank you, Rosa. We're at the end of the hour. Thank you for the book. Uh, thank you for this conversation. And I wanna thank everybody for joining us. And I hope we'll find ways to continue this conversation into the future. Thank you so much, Joel. And thanks everyone.